Hey guys, and welcome to episode eight of the Need to Know with yours truly, Stefan Zimmerman. As you know, my goal with this show and the conversations had here is to interview some of the top performers in the world in a wide range of fields and give you actionable advice, techniques, and mindsets that you can apply directly to your life to build the life of your dreams. Today's guest on the podcast is Dave Dahl, founder of Dave's Killer Bread. Dave has one of the most interesting and inspiring narratives of the power of people to change and grow in their lives that I have ever heard of. Rebelling at a young age and in and out of prison until the age of 38, the first part of Dave's chapter seemed anything but a typical success story. He was headed nowhere fast when he realized that he wanted more out of life and wanted to make a difference in the world. Being released from prison in 2004, Dave rejoined the family bakery with his brother Glenn and quickly started pouring his heart and soul into it. Setting out to make the best possible loaf of bread, Dave created his now infamous Dave's Killer Bread, which became an immediate hit in the local Portland community and beyond. Still having dealt with his fair share of demons along the way, Dave was able to go from being in prison to selling his company for $275 million in just over a decade. Not being an active part of the company anymore, Dave now devotes his time to pursuing his passions, giving back to the community, and spreading his redemption story. In today's episode, we discuss Dave's early life and time in prison, his different transformations in life and how he was able to make a quarter of a billion dollar brand, and much more. The audio is a bit shaky at some points, but the content is truly inspiring and I hope you enjoy and are able to take as much out of this interview as I have. It was truly an honor to do this interview with him and I am incredibly, incredibly excited to share it with you. So without further ado, please meet Dave. So on the show here we have Dave. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, it's an honor. Thank you. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so as I was doing research for this podcast, actually, I was truly fascinated by your life story, as I think you have one of the most unique and interesting narratives that I've personally ever read. Um, therefore, I kind of just wanted to actually dive in and start at the beginning and talk about your childhood a bit. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and the impact that growing up in a Seventh-day Adventist family had on your early years? Well, the Seventh-day Adventist part um, definitely kept me kind of in a closed community um, and out of, you know, I wasn't very, I was pretty sheltered, just put it that way. And then uh, I was working, my parents had a, had a business, had a, had a bakery, and I grew up baking and going to Seventh-day Adventist schools and church. So my whole life was kind of resolved, revolved around uh, this religious thing, and um, you know, it, it worked for a while. I, but I was, I was never really, I never really felt like I fit in anywhere, Seventh Day Adventist or otherwise. So um, it's kind of hard to say how much of it was due to being Seventh Day Adventist, and how much of it was just uh, having a just just being born to the parents and the situation I was in, you know, whatever it was made me who I was. I haven't figured that out. Definitely. And so, yeah, you mentioned when you were growing up, um, your family had a bakery. Um, how intensely were you involved in the family business as a child? At nine years old is when I started and I didn't make much money, but they gave us, you know, I, I had more money than most of my friends you know, I didn't have a lot of friends to begin with, but the people that I knew didn't have money. Um, they didn't work, you know, so they didn't have a place to work. So a lot of people were, you know, that's one thing I had. I was able to buy really inexpensive things really early, but I was making like 25 to 50 cents an hour. And that back then, that was more than it is now, but it still wasn't much. And, uh, I was able to save up enough money to get a guitar or something like yeah. that, you know, things like that. Uh, but I, I wasn't really involved in the business until way later. You know, as far as thinking about the business side of it, I was just working for my dad. Definitely. And so would you say growing up, 
were you interested all in baking or i mean even let alone think that it would play such a big impact in your life no i had I, it was like the last thing i wanted to do by the time i was 13 or 14 i was like man i was embarrassed to be a baker and uh, i was just I, my self-esteem was low anyway i it just felt like being born in this bakery thing was made it even worse, you know. So I was just trying, always trying to figure out how I could do something else. Definitely. And yeah, so kind of going off of that, I, I was reading that as a teen, you know, is when you kind of started to rebel a little bit um, and kind of experiment with alcohol and weed uh, to kind of start off with. So what do you feel caused you to do to do so, to kind of rebel from, you know, the family and, and, and things like that? I, didn't, I never liked my family growing up, and I, I thought that I wasn't. That, um, I felt like I was kind of ashamed of my whole existence, and um, I was looking for any way out. And so, you know, alcohol was another, something I would try, you know, weed. I, I had my friends were all these other outcasts or other misfits, and they would smoke weed or drink and that seemed like a cool thing to do. I never really liked smoking weed or drinking. I mean, I liked drinking, but it always got me in trouble. And smoking weed just made me stupid and paranoid. But I just kept doing it anyway. Yeah, definitely. And um, how old were you when you first uh, were first arrested? And what was like the crime that you committed that um, caused that? Uh, I was that arrested when I was 16 for marijuana possession. Um, let's see, but it really didn't come, didn't matter much. I ended up getting counseling out of that. I never went to juvie, juvenile, uh, detention or anything like that. Um, the other times I got arrested didn't really amount. I mean, I got arrested for being drunk and disorderly at a concert and woke up, uh, in jail the next morning in an adult drunk tank. I was 17 and they didn't know I was only 17, but um, stuff like that was hap- just crazy stuff happened, you know. So my real, my real criminal stuff didn't start till way later. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, um, so how old were you when you first actually went to jail? First went to jail and got charged. That was, um, I was like 23 or four. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And I noticed that one of the things that you said, um, I was actually listening to another interview with you and, um, you actually said that you really suck at crime because your heart's not yeah. in it. Um, so maybe just walk me through what was your mindset at that point? Why did you feel like you kept kind of going into this cycle and kept kind of, why did I feel like- why, why did you feel like you were in this cycle of crime and, um, kind of kept seeing yourself in jail? I didn't, I didn't ever feel like I had anything to lose. That was the thing. I was like, I was doing crazy shit because I couldn't see the results of what I was doing. I just didn't want to be in my shoes and my skin. So it, it wasn't until I started shooting methamphetamine, and that was in my early 20s. It wasn't until then that I really took off on my my change, my my. I call it my first um, transformation in life. When I put a needle full of methamphetamine in my arm, it's like I immediately was a new person. And it felt so good that I thought that this was the answer, you know? And uh, it wasn't, it totally wasn't. Let's get that straight, it was not (laughs) true, but it sure seemed like it. I started really enjoying myself, Mm. but uh, because I, in my job, still working in the bakery at first, uh, I didn't have that much money and it went really fast with the drugs. And, you know, I, I eventually had to turn to crime to support my habit. Gotcha. 
Yeah. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you spent, you know, a total of about 15 years in and out of prison. Um, And so, you know, I'll kind of skip to the end here because I was um, reading an article about you actually on The Ringer. And in there, it said that at one point, you know, you kind of had a change in you where you realized at about age 38 that you wanted out and that you didn't want kind of this life anymore and that you sent a note or, or some type of communication to the prison guards to kind of explain this. Um, so can you maybe explain to me that moment and what inside you like inspired you to finally kind of make that move? I knew I was, um, uh, I knew I wanted out of it a lot sooner, you know, like by the time when I, when I fell, my last time for to go down for my fourth trip to prison with, you know, I was really quickly starting to realize, Hey, I, I suck at this and this is not working. So mm-hmm. what do I, what am I going to do now? So I was so depressed and I was thinking about suicide all the time, having dreams about killing people. I mean, I was a mess, right? Waking up and going, Oh my God, I, I only have five years left. I mean, I'm going to get out. I didn't actually kill somebody, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. That kind of dream is really sucky. Yeah. So you're thinking you killed somebody, you're going to do the rest of your life in prison, and you hate prisons, you know, you're already in prison. And then the, the nightmare turns into, uh, you know, it, it's better than, it's better than the nightmare, actually, what, when you wake up and you see that it sucks, but it's, you still have a chance and eventually having that sort of thinking and being suicidal, thinking about suicide a lot. I finally um, did what you said. I put a kite, they call it a kite into med- um, psych services. And I asked for uh, an appointment to see about getting some medication and um, the medication, you know, helped in it. So there was a lot of things at play. This is the most important thing that ever happened in my life. Definitely. And what was the medication they put you on? Was it just like a... Uh, it was called, uh, at the time, Paxil. And then I eventually got on Infexor. Okay. And those are just like... Depression, a- antidepressant. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And then um, at what point were you released from prison? What, were you released because of like good behavior or was it just the end of your sentence at that point? <sighs> The end of my sentence. I, although, uh, because I went into a, uh, a drug program, I was able to get out. I only did seven and a half years out of ten. Uh, I got a couple years off my sentence, so um, it was still a good chunk of change. But the last after that moment when I took the started taking the meds and I waved the white flag and asked for help. Um, from that point on, I was loving life in prison. See what I'm saying? It was like in prison, going to school, mm-hmm. and for the first time in my life, enjoying, you know, thinking I was okay. Yeah. Working without drugs, you know, without methamphetamine. Because like I said, the methamphetamine was my first transformation. This was the beginning of my new, my real transformation that really changed my life. Definitely. That's incredibly inspiring. And um, so when you were released from prison, um, you reached out to your brother who was still running the family business to see if you could start kind of working for uh, him again. Um, so what was that conversation like for you? How did he react to, well, first off, you coming out of prison and then wanting to like contribute back to the family business? He um, was always willing to give me a chance, you know. I I definitely not done very good in the past with when I wanted to come back, get out of prison and come back and screw it off somehow. So I'm sure he was like, well, it's either he makes it this time or he's probably done, you know. And but he gave me a chance. Um, I don't know what he was, you know, how, but he, I know that he saw something different in me. You know, I was different, so. He knew that I was going to, you know, he had a feeling that I was going to be okay. Gotcha. And I, I, I far exceeded his expectations. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and then, um, you know, besides just your brother, um, what was your relationship like with your family in general? Did you have a relationship with your family or did you kind of not talk to them when you were, you know, in confinement? Well, uh, my daughter, Jess, who was part of this phone call, um, she and I stayed in touch more than anybody else. And, but we were, you know, we never had really been together on the streets because, you know, I wasn't with her mom and I was a druggie and, you know, I could, just didn't really, didn't, she didn't really like me much, bottom line, when I was out there. But when I was, she started wanting to get to know me the last time I was in. And so then, you know, when we got out, when I got out, we spent some time together. But, but um, I was mostly just focused on my work, you know, and and that was good for what I was doing. I yeah. it, it would have been great to have a family, more of a family relationship, but because I didn't have that strong of a family relationship, it gave me a lot of effort. I was able to put a lot of effort into Dave's Killer Brett. Definitely. Now my now my family uh, relationships are really getting better. <laughs> awesome. Well, well, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, and then, so when you you know came out of prison and started working for your brother in the family bakery again, um, where did the inspiration for Dave's Killer Bed first come from? Um, well, it depends on what you talk about, which aspect. But the the recipes that came from you know. When I was in prison, I learned to be a drafter. Mm -hmm. uh, I became a, a, I learned computer aided drafting, and it was just really cool. I had a, a blast um, doing it, and I, it made me open my mind to my abilities that I was capable of doing more than I thought. So, I, it, in, in computer aided drafting, in drafting in general, you're designing all the time, you're creating something. Um, you're drawing something up and sometimes you, you you draw something that already exists and you, you have to take all the measurements and stuff and you, you draw that thing, say a chair, and you have to first learn how to make that chair before you can make a better chair. It's the same way with the bread. I would make the best, I would, I would figure out what I thought was uh, the best bread out there and I would, and then I would go, how, what makes that bread good? I would I would replicate it. I would learn how to make it. Then I would say, well, this is why this bread is good. It, there is room for improvement. <laughs> That's basically what I what I did, and I knew how to improve it because I knew how to make it good. Yeah, definitely. And um, so a lot of work. It was still a lot of work. A lot of a lot of testing. Yeah, I'm sure that was actually going to be my next question: is how long did you kind of tweak and and work at the um, recipe before you came up with, you know, your real first loaf of Dave's Killer Bread? Well, at first, I didn't even know how to make bread exactly. You know, I I had grown up in a bakery, but I didn't remember or really ever learn how to make bread properly. And this is more, you know, how I didn't spend a lot of time experimenting before. But, but now, um, once I learned how to make decent loaves of bread, then it was like, easy from that point on. I just kept designing, creating it. Everything was, I would do like four or five tests at a time, comparing them all, you know, together. And uh, it all went really fast. It was surprising because I was just really ready and I was really working really hard. Uh, I was willing and ready to work really hard. So uh, that's what I did. And it went within, uh, you know, eight, eight months after I got out of prison, I was at the farmer's market selling my bread. Wow. Yeah. And um, can you maybe like recount to me uh, your first experience, like what, what it was like when you created that first loaf of Dave's Killer Bread where you knew, you know, you had kind of perfected the recipe or at least gotten to a point where you were ready to, to start selling it? Well, I knew I had something going on. I had I'd done something pretty cool um, when I created, I had a batch of bread that I called the Blues Bread. And it was before anything about Dave's Killer Bread or anything like that. It was it's still around, by the way, but we hadn't started calling it Dave's Killer Bread yet. Mm -hmm. I pulled this five loaves of bread out of the oven, and, you know, it was as beautiful as I imagined it, or <laughs> even more beautiful. 
there's something there was something artistically beautiful about it. Yeah. But it was even better when you tasted it. And you know, you wait for it to cool down and you uh, slice it up and you see how it, how, how it's going to be. I gave a couple loaves out to people that were workers and they started freaking out and flipping out on me. The next day they were like, dude, you got something. <laughs> and it just kept, you know, I had haters. I had people who, who were like, ah, this shit sucks. So I had that. <laughs> yeah. but I, I came to realize real quickly that there was going to be haters, but I had something. Definitely. Um, and so when you first, you know, started taking it to the farmer's markets, um, was it like an immediate success, would you say, where people, you know, just immediately kind of raving about it? Yeah. This is what, this is what I remember uh, happening quite a bit, of, like the first time. I had, I only brought four kinds of bread to the first farmer's market. Um, and each, I had a bowl of samples for each loaf, each kind. And people would walk up and grab a little sample. And I remember these old ladies doing a lot of it. And they have a sample and I didn't see anything on their face or anything, but they turned around and walked away. And then minutes later, they came back with a crowd of people. <laughs> now they're all, they're all going crazy about my bread and talking to me about my story. Uh, within, within a couple of weeks, I had a news lady do that. And, then, you know, she started talking about, well, this is, I love your story. I want to put it, your bread's amazing and your story is even better. Let's get you on TV, you know? So it was, it was unbelievable. It happened so fast in a way. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I can even say that I had one of those similar experiences myself. I'm originally from Belgium. So growing up in Belgium, you know, right. bread was a huge deal. You know, you have a lot of fresh bakeries there where it's normal to, you know, in the mornings, go get a loaf of fresh bread. And just the bread there just tasted so different from anything I ever had growing up in America, especially something that you would buy in the stores. And then I remember, I think, I think it's got to be like five years ago, at least. Um, I had my first loaf of Dave's Killer Bread. I saw it in the store and I was like, huh, this looks a lot like what I've seen in Belgium and it looks really good. And I went home, honestly, not having the highest expectations just because store-bought typically it's not, you know, it doesn't taste very fresh or doesn't taste very full. But that first experience trying Dave's Killer Bread when I was, you know, you know, X years old, it was, it was pretty transformational too, because it's such a great quality tasting bread for something that, you know, sits on a shelf life for a week or, or something like that. Yeah. It's got to last. That's one of the tricks. It's one of the things about it. That's, that is great that it lasts pretty good. Um, but where, where was this at? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So this was actually back when I was living at home. Um, so me and my family moved to New Jersey when I was five years old. And then I grew up there up until I moved out to San Diego for college. But I would, I was, I want to say I was probably in my junior or senior year of high school. So probably about like five, six years ago. Where was it at though? Uh, New Jersey. Your first taste of Dave's Club Bread was in New Jersey? Yep. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. Six, five or six years ago. Yeah, it was just it was just new there then, probably. Yeah, no, definitely. New. Yeah, definitely. It was it was the first that I'd ever seen of it, and then you know I tried it, and we be, immediately came repeat buyers, and I'm sure that's what a lot of your customers are too. Is just that's added. what I that was what started, you know, exactly. It just blew me away that people loved it that much. Definitely, yeah, and um, so then transitioning from the farmer's markets, you know, you kind of saw the success locally The your local customers were raving about it. The news picked it up. Um, so then when did you make that transition into, you know, grocery stores and, and what was that process like? It was a, um, subtle sort of gradual transition because, you know, the farmer's market was the perfect place to test out what the people liked it and stuff. But then the problem was, when the farmer's market season is over and it starts raining and all that, well, people still want the bread. Yeah. So they were like, what's, what's going to happen when the farmer's market's over? I got to have this bread. Yeah. And I'm like, well, it's up to you to get it in your store. You got to let them know, yeah. you know? 
and they did they they died in one little store and then one other little store kind of specialty stores first because mm-hmm. they have like people you can work with really easily as the stores get bigger they it, they have more barriers you know because people are always trying to get stuff in the stores but because of the demand of my bread you know popular demand word of mouth all that great stuff is what got me it, it, it pulled my bread into one market after another. You get what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah. And so would you say most of it was just word of mouth or did you also have to do a lot of, you know, physical demos and going into grocery stores? Lots of demos. I did tons and tons of demos. Most of them myself. Um, I would make the bread. I would do demos. I would do as many farmer's markets as I could, like different there was like eventually you, you could almost get a farmer's market per day, sometimes like two you know, on weekends. I would do three mm-hmm. and it was, it was a hell of a lot of work. It was, it was, and it, I re- we realized really early on that the key to selling this bread was one thing, get them to try. <laughs> if once somebody tries this bread, you know, Seven out of ten people, it's going to be their favorite loaf of bread, you know. And so we're going to, I mean, that's a number I just threw out there. I don't know. But uh, it was surprising just how powerful it was just to get it in their mouths. Definitely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a testament to the product as well. And I think personally, again, me, you know, I guess we're, growing up, we, we appreciated a good loaf of bread and it was, it was definitely hard to find, you know, I, you know, before that, um, you know, the 13 years previous where I was living in the U S we, you know, we never really found something that was anywhere similar to what you would typically get in, you know, Belgium in like a fresh bakery or something like that. I'm going to have to go to Belgium and try their bread. Yeah. You, you'll definitely have to let me know how, what, what you think, but, um, yeah, so it was, it was kind of, again, like a transformational experience with, in, in regards to that and just the product. I mean, like you said, I think it does sell itself and it was kind of astonishing that nobody had ever really perfected that recipe before that it took that long for people to, you know, come up with such a good product. Yeah. It's kind of like, you you see that in in the world, how some things you would have thought that would have happened a long time before that, but it was just, that was out there in the universe and the ether just waiting for me to, to say, Hey, there you are. You know, definitely it existed because it's just, it's just a combination of ingredients and a process that just took, it was a labor of love. Somebody had to come along and go, you know, that when you say that one of the challenges that most people have, and this is really good for entrepreneurs to know, um, one of the challenges is that most people are trying to get everything to fit into a price point or, mm-hmm. or, or this is what somebody wants. I didn't do that. I made the very best bread I could make and didn't think about the price. That was one of the big fears that we had with, oh, this is expensive to make. We took it to the farmer's market thinking, people, are people going to pay this? Yeah, they're paid. They'll get, if they'll pay for the best, you yeah. know, it's like a Cadillac or whatever your favorite car is, uh, that's high end. You buy it, you pay more because it's better. Definitely. No, I, I completely agree with that. And that's great advice as well. Um, and then, so at what point did you see the business really take off where it went from, okay, this is a local su- success to like, you almost couldn't meet the demand out there. Well, we had to grow gradually because we didn't have, um, we didn't have the means of making enough bread to keep up with the demand in all these areas. Mm-hmm. So everything had to grow at um, a reasonable rate that, that we could keep up. We started with a small place in Northeast Portland that had was, you know, that was really the, the descendant of my dad's bakery. Um, it was, it was 50 years later after my dad had started his bakery. Now I'm starting this thing. Um, and we, uh, you know, we started there, but quickly outgrew it once things got popular. And the challenge there was, it was 2008, in the middle of, you know, the recession had mm-hmm. started. And 
we had it did, people didn't care. They were buying the bread. They, they didn't stop eating the bread because the recession. They stopped doing other things. <laughs> but the problem with that is that we could we could not prove that we could pay off a loan. We need a loan to grow into the next place, mm-hmm. bigger place. So that was the first challenge, big challenge we had was getting, we finally were able to get a loan from a smaller bank and we moved. And so then eventually we got Costco. And once we got into Costco, it was crazy. Yeah. We, but we had to, we had to manage our growth. You know, we, we had to go, no, we won't do that yet. We can't do that. That will destroy us. Mm-hmm. But we had to stay ahead of the competition. And the competition was always is always there. You know, because there, now there's knockoffs all over the place. You know, they're all cheaper versions of Dave's kind of bread, but you know, people learned how to make the basic um, the basic recipe and started knocking it off. So you know, it was a lot of you know, be trying to manage your growth. Mm-hmm. But it was I knew pretty soon pretty early that um, we couldn't. We had to, we had to grow as fast as possible to keep ahead of others. Definitely. And so, you know, what piece of advice, you know, given that you've gone through from a company, you know, going from small to huge, um, and just kind of creating that business, what piece of advice would you have for entrepreneurs who may not even necessarily be in the food industry, but, you know, maybe just in general when it comes to business? Well, I'll tell you, uh, there's a, that's a very open-ended question answer. Um, there's so much, there's so many things I could say on that, but, uh, just in general, for me, it was, uh, first of all, you got to love what you do, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to believe in what you're doing. You got to be willing to work super hard. It's hard, harder than anybody else. Nobody else is going to, you can't get it. You, harder than any employee would ever work because you're an entrepreneur. You, you, and then you have to be willing to fail a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, I failed. I failed many times trying to make this bread, Mm -hmm. but I did it in a very short time. It was like several months. I expected to fail at this too, and then learn from it and be better on the next try. But I was successful very quickly. Normally, people aren't that successful Mm -hmm. that fast. So you have to be resilient, thick-skinned. You have to be humble. I think it's, I don't know, I like, Humility. I like to to be who you who I am, no more, no less. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody who thinks that they're going to act like they're an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, and that you know, be who you are. Don't act like anybody, um, and that's the best way you can be. I think being authentic and um, hardworking and resilient and accepting learning to accept things as they really are so you can always be get make them better you can't make something better if you don't know if you won't even accept the way it is definitely you get what i'm saying there definitely definitely yeah no that's incredible advice all of it <laughs> so I'll, I'll definitely you know that's a general rule of life for me that, it, but it also is true in business right right awesome um yeah and then so in 2015, um, you know, you guys had first in 2012 sold about half of the company to an equity firm. But then in 2015, um, Dave's Killer Bread was officially sold to Flower Foods for $275 million. It's a crazy number. <laughs> yeah. Can you describe? Never would have dreamed. Yeah, exactly. Can you describe what you felt at that moment? Oh, it was complicated. Uh, it was a complex feeling because... I'm losing my baby. It was my passion. It was my life. You know, I lived and breathed Dave's Killer Bread. But I started having problems in 2012, 13, with drinking. And eventually, eventually I had a run in with cops uh, out in Washington County here. Um, and it changed my life. It, it was, it was, I was not ready. I had, I had transformed back in 2001, but now I had slid back into a bad way of living. I was a criminal, but I was drinking. So the drinking was making me stupid, you know, and uh, long story short, and, um, I ended up having a mental breakdown. And 
So because of all that, made it hard for me to keep um, a grip on the company as it got so big and I was fighting with everybody. Um, and eventually, I was happy to see it go. You know, it was no longer the company I loved, the, the product. It was no longer mine. It was something else. And so I enjoyed getting the money. Um, and it put me on a different, had a different path I had to start over, you know. So the early year, the early part of that was just, I mean, before that happened, it was just like a tough time for me, you know. Definitely. Uh, losing my baby. Yeah, no, definitely. And so, you know, overall from being in prison until age 38 to then selling your company for a quarter of a billion dollars about, you know, 10 years later, I would say on paper is one of the most inspiring stories of change that I've personally ever read. So by all conventional standards, you know, Dave Killer's bread made you a successful man. My question is, I know that, you know, you just mentioned in 2012, you kind of had a fallback where you had, you know, noticed that you were getting back into drinking habits and then a run in with the cops. So throughout this process after 2012, did you also notice a change internally um, in terms of like, you know, growing up, finding purpose with the company as well? Well, those, those years from 2005 to 2012, most of those years were the most amazing of my life because I was, I was in the zone, you know, loving what I was doing and people, other people loving what I was doing. So it was, you couldn't have asked for a better time. From the time I started drinking too much to the time I had my problem where I fought with the cops, I didn't fight with them. I got beat up by the cops. That's mm -hmm. another way to put it. <laughs> and from that, those couple of years were not very good. After I had my breakdown and I, I started working on getting healthy again, um, they started, it came out of the ashes like the Phoenix. You know, I, I've risen and I've it's been slow. You know, I did a couple of years where I got into African art so heavily that because I didn't want to think about me anymore, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want to think about my issues. I just wanted to get outside myself. And so I focused on studying African art of all things. And people don't get why, but I tell them it's because it has nothing to do with Dave Dahl. Yeah. That was a good thing for me, you know? And so I think I've healed I've healed up in the last couple of years. I'm better than ever. I'm older. I'm more beat up. Yeah. But I am better than ever. That's the thing about getting older, that you should always get better. Yeah. No, incredible advice. And very happy to hear that, of course. Um, and then, so you mentioned in an interview that you said money has nothing to do with happiness. You know, given that Dave's Killer Bread, the selling of that company to Flower Foods probably made you wealthier than you'd ever imagined possible. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Has money, you know, made you happier? Or what what player yeah, has money played? Yeah, it's a great question. Really? It's a great question. You know, everybody talks about that. No, there's not a single person in the world who hasn't wrestled with that idea. Uh, you know, money. Well, why, why wouldn't money make me happy? You know? mm -hmm. um, it, the thing is, when you have pure purpose, it's, it's, when, I'm only comparing it to the most perfect days of Days of Good Bread. When I wake up in the morning and I, if I have a, a day where I'm struggling a little bit, I think back to my worst days and I go, this ain't shit, right? Yeah. It's, it's fine. So as long as I compare it like that, I'm always okay. And then, uh, but it's the same way. Everything's like that now. It's like I compare uh, my my worst days with the good days now. And you know, having money. It's, so now, really, I'm say this is your your middle path. That's I really like to go down the middle path. There's the Buddhist. I studied a little bit of Buddhism, just mm -hmm. enough to take a few things nuggets. One of those is that Buddhist middle path where you just go down that road and you're never very, never very sad. You're never extremely excited in the, for very long because you know, once you attach yourself to something like that, you're going to, it's going to pull you in a direction that you're going to have to snap back from. 
Um, so, but, but when I got the money, instead, okay, because of the hard work and the love that I had for my business, it eventually paid off in so much, such financial success. But I had, when I lost what made me so happy, the company, the bread, the work, and the, the employees, and just the whole thing, um, the money was not going to replace that. Mm-hmm. You know? So the different, the thing is though, I, I admit that ha- having money is something you can get used to and really enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it doesn't replace the best, the best things in life. Definitely. So it's good to have it all. And I, and I don't think anybody can be happy without being happy before they get money. Of course. You can have money and take, you can have, you can be happy and get money and stay happy. Maybe, <laughs> but I don't think the other way around works. Yeah. Or if you're miserable and you get money, it may, may, it might make you happy for a minute, but then you, you're still you. And that, that you is either going to be happy or sad, money or no money. Definitely. That's incredibly powerful. Um, and kind of going off of that as well, I know that you mentioned that you just find great satisfaction in fighting the good fight one day at a time. So is that now how you kind of tried to view your life more of, you know, taking day, uh, things one day at a time, trying to just maximize each day, I guess? Yeah, I'm very fortunate because my, my first 38 years sucked, you know, unless I was high on math and those were moments, fleeting moments. After I had my experience of humility, acceptance, hard work, accountability, those are very important things. Once I learned the value of those things, most of my life has been amazing since then. Um, and so I know how to create a better future. I know, I know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And it, it takes all of those things. It takes being able to be honest with yourself and that not care what other people think of you. If you're on the right track, you don't care what anybody else. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for you. Once you realize that you're doing it for you and, and you know that you're doing what you want to do, then, you know, fuck them. That's, that's one important. And then it's that acceptance and that humility gives you courage. And you take that account, you take that and you're accountable to yourself you don't beat yourself up for your mistakes. Rather, you embrace them and, and learn, you know, something from them. And that just comes with life experience with a positive attitude. You know, if you keep a positive attitude and you don't judge people because, you know, once you start any kind of negativity, is is it, it drags you down. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing that really changed my life was asking for help and getting medication and the medication stopped me, helped me make a choice not to go down these negative paths. I was always mad at the prison guards. I was always mad at other inmates. I was mad at my circumstances. Everything made me mad. And once I decided to give that up, I started going the right way. Positive thinking is the absence of negativity. You can't be a negative person and expect to be successful. Yeah, of course. Um, and I know that's also a big part of your brand, especially Dave's Killer Bread, at least when you were working there. Um, a big part of the company, too, was that um, you kind of hired ex-convicts to kind of give them that second chance, give them the ability to create a new life. So, um, yeah, can you maybe just elaborate a little bit on that? What? Because uh, I know that you mentioned that you believe that forgiveness of self and others is one of the keys to inner peace and personal growth as well. So just kind of, I guess, passing that on to other people as well. Um, you know, how has that affected your life? It's exponential. Um I consider myself, it's like I make this loaf of bread, this one variety called Good Seed. I named the bread Good Seed before I ever made it. Mm-hmm. And it was it was about my transformation. I was, you know how people talk about, he's a bad seed, or that's a bad seed. Mm-hmm. Some people even brag about it. Yeah, I'm a bad seed. No, 
I'm a good seed. I go out there and I plant seeds that make that make a better world. Mm-hmm. I focus on making my world better first, and then by extension, help hopefully other people's worlds get better too. Because it's my, because their worlds are my world. We share, we share. Those <laughs> worlds. Uh, so it was a no brainer to me when I had my personal transformation. I was able to see how how much difference it made, mm-hmm. and how much I could be a, a a good a good force in the world. Why not? let others do that too especially you want good employees get people who are grateful get people who are motivated you get the right people coming out of prison and they kick ass definitely no, it's incredible that you did that and, and gave all those people you know second chances at life here um so what do your days look like now that you know you're not part of um, the company anymore and i guess you know you have more free time to invest in other passions and hobbies i know you mentioned that african art was something you dove into um for a while so like what what do your days typically look like now well sometimes because i got into the african art so heavily i i have to go back and fill in the gaps with my African art. Like I'm going, I'm inventorying this massive collection of African art that I have and trying to make it so that I can uh, sell, sell some, you know, um, at auction houses, things like that. So all that takes a lot of work. So that's one thing. Uh, and then I have uh, African art business that sells online. That's a separate, that's a separate thing. Cause that's not my collection so much. That's more inventory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the African art does take some of my time, but I have employees that take to do most of that. Myself, um, I'm kind of, that's why, why I'm doing stuff like this right now, because I just want to get back out there and see how I can continue making a difference, you Definitely. know, with, and so for instance, I have a, a documentary being produced about me right oh. now, and that takes some of my time. I have a movie that might be uh, coming together by some really, really cool people that have, have decided they want to do my story. Uh, it just goes on and on, you know, and I'm always a part of some, you know, if anybody wants to check out a cool nonprofit that makes a hell of a lot of difference in the world, it's Constructing Hope. Uh, if you look up constructing or constructing org, you can see why I'm passionate, what it is. That it's something that I'm passionate about because it's learning a trade in prison that changed my life. Mm-hmm. It's just one of the things that really made a difference in my life. I became a drafter in prison. And from that point on, I believed in myself and I was able to make stuff happen. Um, I have seen so many people's lives changed by learning a trade. Mm-hmm. They don't have to go to college. Not everybody's a college person. Some people are better off learning a trade. And there's a lot of trade opportunities out there. So that's another thing that and I just made two videos to support that. Uh, that'll be on the internet at some point. But I, it just, all this stuff just takes my time. You know, I get up in the morning, I work out and I even have a band, you know, awesome. Every every time I have a new thought, it's something else I'm doing. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm a creative person. Yeah, you know, I create work. <laughs> awesome, awesome, cool. Um, yeah, and then before you know, I uh, before I ask my last question here, um, this is maybe just a good opportunity for you to tell my listeners where they can find you. Um, are you active on social media at all, or where's the best place for my well, listeners best, to connect? The best place to inter- be introduced to me is davedoll 360com mm-hmm. It's a website. I don't. It's a little behind. It's not. It's, but you can go to my Facebook page. I have Dave Doll Facebook. There's a picture uh, of me and my one of my daughters on the front, and that's my personal page. And I'm mm-hmm. I'm pretty open, and people are welcome to come on and say hi, and you know whatever. I just don't want people coming on with a bunch of crazy, you know, things they want me to do. You know? Definitely, I'm busy. So. <laughs> But uh, I have that, and I have Dave Dahl, uh, creator, co-founder, Dave Skiller Bread. That's my public page. Cool. And so uh, I haven't done Instagram that much yet. So. Yeah. Awesome. But people are welcome to contact me uh, for good reasons. If they contact me for stupid reasons, I won't respond. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Well, that's actually how I... Uh... 
I got in contact with you. I put the, I filled out the form on your website and then yeah. um, your daughter actually replied to me. So I was very happy about that. And then, yeah, we had a brief chat on the phone here before this interview. And, you know, I was really appreciative of you, you know, taking the time to come on the show. Um, so, so thank you again for did you that. Hear the, did you hear the uh, interview uh, with Guy Ross? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cause that, that really got a lot of attention. So I, I've been doing, I've been meeting a lot of people because of that. And, you know, I love meeting people. I, I love meeting you. It's, uh, I, I like to think that because we met and talked that it's going to be a better world. <laughs> way yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, I, again, I really appreciate you taking the time and very fortunate to meet you as well. Um, but yeah, so then my last question here for you is um, if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, metaphorically speaking, getting a message out to millions or billions of people, uh, what would you say and why? Wow. Well, it would have something to do with the serenity prayer. Yeah. You know what the serenity prayer is? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. It's all about acceptance. Um, it's all about doing your best with what you've got. Mm -hmm. It's about, it, it, for me, it's like, make your own world the best it can be, honestly and truthfully, and, then op and openly, and then help others. Help others do the same thing. Awesome. That's powerful and, and perfect. When you help others, you help yourself. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Now, incredibly powerful stuff. And yeah, so that'll kind of wrap up the podcast here. Again, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come out and talk to me. And, you know, your message is inspiring. Your story is inspiring. And I'm sure you'll continue to inspire many, many people. All right, brother. Look out for the documentary coming in about a year. <laughs> definitely will do. I think mean, people are going to love it. Yeah, no, definitely. All right, guys, so that will do it for today's episode of the Need to Know podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening and taking the time out of your day to do so. I really, really appreciate it and hope that you were able to take some valuable insights from today's episode. I'm constantly trying to improve this podcast, so if you do have a second after you're done listening to go and leave me a review and hit the subscribe button. That would be incredibly appreciated. If you want to follow me and see what I'm up to, you can follow me on Instagram with the username Stefan Zim, that is Z-I-double-M, or go to my website, stephanzim.com. Hope you guys have a great day and until next time.